What is up, Engine Heads? Welcome to another episode of Boo School, the YouTube equivalent of a university course on forced induction made possible by AEM Performance Electronics. Today we're talking about piston rings, more specifically the ring gap, and we'll be answering when and how you should adjust the gap on your piston rings. As you know, the piston rings play an absolutely key part in your engine. They hold combustion pressures in the combustion chamber. In other words, they ensure that combustion pushes the piston downward instead of going past the piston. But the very construction of a piston ring is a compromise. Because we can't use rubber bands for piston rings, all piston rings must have a slit or gap in them so that they can be installed and removed from pistons. Of course, this gap shouldn't be too large because then it will let combustion pressures escape through the gap and reduce power and efficiency. But being too small is an even worse case scenario when it comes to piston ring gaps. Other than holding combustion pressure in, piston rings have another key task, and that's to transfer heat away from the piston to the cylinder, and then the cylinder transfers the heat away to the coolant passing around it. As you know, metal, like most things, expands under heat. This means that piston rings also expand under heat. If the ring gap is too small, then the ring will expand within the limited space of the cylinder, and the rings will eventually run into each other. When this happens, the ring will have nowhere left to go, and as more heat is introduced, the pressure exerted by the ring on the cylinder will increase. This means that more friction will occur between the ring and the cylinder, and this will produce even more heat. Eventually, the amount of heat will become too high for the ring to transfer it away to the cylinder and coolant. Finally, the piston will start to overheat, and by doing so, it will start losing its structural integrity. This combined with the added resistance between the ring and the cylinder means that catastrophic failure is just a matter of time. The most common scenario is broken ring glands and loss of compression together with possible cylinder damage. In any case, the engine needs to come out for inspection and a rebuild. So what does this tell you? Well, it tells you that more heat means more ring expansion. If we're rebuilding our engine in stock form without significant modifications, we don't need to touch the ring gap. But if we modify our engine in ways to introduce more heat into the combustion chamber, we need to increase the ring gap to account for this added heat. Increasing the compression ratio of your engine, for example, increases the heat in the combustion chamber, because the air and fuel mixture are now compressed to a greater extent. The more you compress a gas, the closer its molecules come to each other. The closer they are to each other, the more they will contact each other and thus generate more friction and more heat. We can also add additional heat by significantly increasing the redline of our engine and spending prolonged periods of time at that redline. More engine revolutions means more friction between the rings and the cylinder over the same period of time and thus more heat. But by far the greatest addition of heat into the engine is adding turbocharging or supercharging to a previously naturally aspirated engine or significantly increasing the boost levels in an already turbocharged or supercharged engine. Forced induction stuffs far more air molecules into the same space compared to natural aspiration, which means that it significantly increases the number of molecules in that same space, which means that it increases the heat during compression and combustion, and thus increases the amount of heat to which the piston rings will be exposed. To account for this, adding forced induction or significantly increasing boost often calls for an adjustment of the piston ring gap. Before we can adjust the ring gap, we first must measure it to see what we're starting with. To measure the ring gap, we need to squeeze the ring into the cylinder. Do this slowly and carefully without applying too much force to the rings. Never twist or roughly handle rings in any way. If you distort their shapes, they need to be thrown away and replaced. Once the ring is in the bore, you are going to get a piston that has no rings on it and use it to push the ring past the very top of the bore. Some 10 to 20 millimeters past the top of the bore is a good location. Make sure that the piston is square inside the bore by checking its height against the deck at multiple places. This will ensure that your ring sits square inside the bore and will result in an accurate measurement. Once the ring is in, get a feeler gauge and measure the gap. Do not force the feelers into the gap as that will likely distort the position of the ring and give you a false measurement. Insert feelers until you find a combination of one or multiple feelers that fit nice and snug into the gap. This is your starting ring gap. 
so we have a starting gap of 0.5 millimeters for our first ring. If we consult the factory service manual for this engine, which is a Toyota 4AGE 16 valve 08 big port engine, it tells us that the proper ring gap for the first ring is between 0.25 to 0.47 millimeters. As you can see, we're already at the very end of that limit. Now let's imagine that we're going to turbocharge this previously naturally aspirated engine. We're going to add a turbo and we'll run about 20 to 25 psi of boost pressure to try and reach in excess of 250 horsepower, for example. When it comes to application, our engine will see a mix of street and track driving. So how much should we increase the gap? Well, to answer that question, I made this little table. This is a bit different to what you see with most online ring gap calculators, but it gives you very similar or the same values. It only expands with a bit of additional info and options. And as you can see, according to the table, our target ring gap for our 20 to 25 PSI of boost pressure is 0.52 millimeters. So we're already pretty close. If we consult the factory service manual, we will also see that it recommends to run our second ring tighter than our first ring. The reason behind this is that this is a 30 year old factory service manual. If you go out and buy a set of aftermarket rings today and consult their fitting instructions, you will see that nowadays all of them recommend to run the second ring with a larger gap than the first one. You will see the same thing in our table. In fact, most modern stock vehicles now run the second ring with a larger gap than the first one. This seems counterintuitive as the second ring sees less heat, but more recent experiments and testing have shown that running the second ring with a larger gap than the first one actually helps the first ring. No matter how well the gap is suited to the engine, some combustion pressure will inevitably get past it. If the second ring is tighter, it can cause that combustion pressure to remain trapped between the first and the second ring, and this will then destabilize the first ring, greatly reducing its capabilities to keep compression and combustion pressures in check. This is why we run the second ring with a slightly larger gap. Okay, so now we know our starting ring gap and we know our target gap. How do we increase that gap? As you can see, I'm doing it using a manual filer. The other two options are to use a fine file that you can put in a vise and drag the ring across it, or you can use an electric ring gapping tool. This is a special tool and it's usually very expensive. So of these three methods, the one that makes the most sense for most enthusiasts is the manual ring filing tool. Now, if you haven't filed rings before, a word of warning, it takes a very long time. Even increasing the gap from 0.50 to 0.52 millimeters takes more time than you would think. It is extremely important to do this very slowly and methodically. If you try to rush it and get it done quickly, I'm willing to bet you will ruin your rings. So when filing rings, here's what not to do. Do not turn the handle too quickly. Turn it at a relatively slow speed and try to maintain an even speed as much as possible. Do not file for too long. Once you feel that you have removed some material, put the ring back in the bore and measure again. The hand that holds the ring does not have the task of pushing the ring into the filing disc. Too much pressure will chip and destroy the ring. That hand that holds the ring only ensures that there is mild contact between the filing disc and the ring so that material can be removed slowly and evenly. Feeding the ring too aggressively into the disc will surely ruin it. The only other task that the hand that holds the ring has is to ensure that the ring stays still and does not vibrate. These two posts are used to stabilize the ring against them. A ring that vibrates as it's being filed will chip. If it's chipped, throw it away and get new ones. Do not file the ring at an angle. This will also ruin it. Ensure that the ring is square to the filing disc and keep it that way. Do not file on both sides of the gap. Choose one side and file only on that side. Do not change the direction of filing. Decide on one direction of turning and keep it for all rings. Most people choose to file from the outside in. And once again, stop and measure often. Do not file too much. In general, when it comes to piston ring gaps, it's better to err on the side of caution. If your gap is right at the minimum mark of the gap recommended by the ring manufacturer, it's a good idea to expand it just a bit above the minimum. It will cost you a fraction of a single horsepower, but it could save your engine. 
Once you achieve the proper ring gap, inspect the ring ends and if they need to be deburred, you can use very fine sandpaper and very lightly deburr the edges of any sharp material. Do not chamfer the edges in any way. In most cases, the rings will not need deburring and you should only spend a second or two with the sandpaper to remove any sharp material. Once you're done, you can adjust the gap on all the other rings. When it comes to the oil rings, they almost never need to be gapped. When it comes to their gap, you can consult your factory service manual and simply verify that the gap of the rails is close to the maximum or in the second half of the range in case you're adding force induction or significantly increasing boost. Do not touch or modify the spacer in any way. Now this is just a junk engine I'm using for demonstration purposes, but as you can see we are measuring towards the top of the cylinder. If you're working on a block that hasn't been freshly bored and honed, it's a good idea to measure ring and gap at the middle and towards the bottom of the cylinder. If there is significant difference in measurement, it means your cylinder is tapered. If it's too tapered, it might need to be re-bored. I have already verified that these cylinders do in fact have a slight taper and the ring gap confirms it as well. A freshly reboard and honed cylinder should have identical ring gap measurements at all heights. And there you have it, that's pretty much it when it comes to ring gaps and how to measure and adjust them. Hope you enjoy that and I hope it helps you if you decide to modify the ring gap in your next engine belt. As always, thanks a lot for watching and I'll be seeing you soon with more fun and useful stuff on the D4A channel.